so this is kind of an update quickly on what we're doing with um, the study that you've already heard about and that we presented last spring. Um, so really, the point of the study, and this was so far we're the only uh, state that we know of that's actually done anything like this, not to say that it was actually hard, but just to say that um, we're actually now being called by other states to share how we did this and to try to create comparative studies. So for example, last week I talked to the state of Montana who is looking at trying to do a similar study uh, as they adapt to the Clean Power Plan. But really the question is not so much um, what the Clean Power Plan is or any kind of greenhouse gas controls, but really so much as what it means for the state and for the economy as a whole in the country. And so really, you know, what we're being asked to do is, is look around the corner and see if we can figure out what's coming. So do we need to slow down? Are we fine? Is there a deer just around the corner? Um, what's going to, you know, a hole, the bridge washout, whatever. Um, the only thing I can say about any of our forecasts with certainty is that they'll be wrong. Uh, so, you know, you have to keep that in mind. But that said, having some sort of, you know, at least educated guess of what's going on is probably a lot more than just hearing people speak without any sort of foundation. And so that's why we've tried to do this. Um, first of all, you're going to see a lot of graphs because I'm an economist and these are the kind of pictures that we look at. Um, but the bottom line is I always find this kind of picture to be amazing, just what happened with Wyoming and coal production. So this is just 10-year averages with the exception of that last bar. And this just gives you a sense of, of how much uh, coal production in Wyoming grew. I can, there'll be other pictures like this, so if you love this one, just wait. Um, but we produce now, as you've heard already, 40% of the country's coal. And the important part of that's about 400 million tons a year. Um, and yesterday you heard an awful lot from Todd and Al about what the clean power plan is going to mean for Wyoming. Um, but I would suggest that, you know, that's really, really we need to focus on what it means for coal. So we produce as much as the next six states combined. Um, I tell people that, in fact, I was interviewed by NPR a few weeks ago. And when I told them that in the story, I got an email back when they played the story, and they changed it to the next four states combined in the story. And, and the reporter called me back, and he said, you know, I'm really sorry about that statistic, but my editor just would not let that go. He wanted it to be twice as much as West Virginia. And I said, well, you know, I sent you the numbers. And he said, yeah, but they just didn't believe that. So to give you another sense of you know, they just didn't want, you know, they, in his mind, actually using the real numbers was just too big and people would blow it off because people in the United States still think that all the coal mining happens in West Virginia. Um, so there's just another picture of the annual um, output of coal in the United States, or sorry, in, in Wyoming. And the big problem and the reason this study was initiated, which we're now updating, is that you can see that peak and then the drop-off. And that drop-off has not been so much due to regulation as it has been to natural gas. Uh, natural gas has really been the killer. Um, and cheap gas prices like they are now are the reason that coal is in so much trouble. Um, and what really happens to coal has, I would argue, more to do with what happens in Pennsylvania than what happens uh, with the clean power plan coming up now, at least in the near term. Other events, though, renewables, mats, things that we've heard about. Just to give you another sense, and this is what I had to send to that NPR guy, so I'm just, you know, at this point, extemporizing. But um, those are the top 10 coal mines in the country. The top eight, eight of those 10 are in Wyoming. Those two that I have in the box, just those two mines produce 20% of the United States coal. And if you look at the first mine, North Antelope Rochelle, that would be equivalent to all the coal and more that comes out of West Virginia, the second largest coal producing state, not single mine state. And in fact, Black Thunder produces about 20 to 25 percent more coal than the third largest state, which is all of Kentucky. So, you know, when you hear about these things and you really try to put this in perspective, one of the problems that Wyoming faces getting on the kind of national 
stage to just talk about the impacts of policy is that people still don't realize how important this is, not only to the state, but to the country. So that was one of the other reasons that we kind of have continued with this study, is really it's about education. Um, but really, here's the crux of the issue. The Clean Power Plan, it does not matter. You heard about all the complexities, and I'll come back to that at the end, and, and I'll have my own little meltdown like you saw yesterday. But um, the bottom line is that the Clean Power Plan, as complex it is, as it is, and all this mass versus rate and all this stuff, for Wyoming, it does not matter. All of that stuff you heard yesterday about the utilities, it does not matter because what Wyoming does will not determine what happens to the coal economy in Wyoming. Just look at the numbers. We produce 400 million tons of coal. We actually use for our own consumption about 12 million tons of coal. So this is based on amounts from 2012. It's a little lower than that now, total numbers. We export 93% of that coal by train and another 4% goes out by wire. So, you know, another way to think about this is we will not be the only ones covering the costs in our utility sector. Other people will also have to bear that cost. Either they will see higher utility prices as Wyoming fueled electricity goes to Colorado or elsewhere into the Dakotas, which is where some of it's going now. Um, or they will have to find other sources which is going to raise their cost of electricity. So we are not the only ones bearing the cost and so the point I'd make is this is a national problem. There are 34 states there and you'll see Wyoming is the fourth largest producer of its own coal that other people use a lot more of it than we do. So the real crux of the clean power plan has got nothing to do with what we do with our own coal, it has everything to do with what everybody else who uses our coal will do. And so really, in order to see around the corner and what's going to happen to Wyoming, you, you really don't worry too much about what's going to happen in Wyoming so much as what happens everywhere else. So last year when I presented this, or, or earlier this spring, uh, we, the way we did the modeling, and I'm not going to go too much into that, this is just a simple line graph over time of what will, would happen the EIA would project using their models if we had no regulation, that's those lines at the top. So coal production would kind of top out at around 450 million tons a year from, the, from Wyoming. And with the clean power plan, it really depended. We worked with Rhodium on this. They actually run the clean, or the, the NEMS model. So we you know, commissioned them, got them to share their data with us. And the forecasts within their study, which we presented last year, were anywhere from a 32% reduction at the worst year to a 51% reduction in Wyoming coal output between now and 2030. So that's a big number. But one thing to remember about this study was that it was defined on the basis of what are the main policy variables under the 2014 proposal, which has changed. And so really it was kind of a spectrum analysis. This is one end, this is the other end, holding everything else at one place. This is one end, this is the other. It's gonna be somewhere in the middle. So, um, you know, the 51% decline, that's a headliner, but one thing I'd say is, you know, you have to be responsible with the numbers you show. I don't think that's going to be the number. In fact, more recent data would say that the number is even going to be less than 32. So I'll come to that in a minute. But these were the ranges that we came out in this study. Now, more recently, the EIA took their own model, and instead of running four scenarios, they ran 30 or so. And they, ran, they were asked by Congress to run the CPP numbers through their model, and so we've extracted from their model what this means for Wyoming. And the big difference between their simulation and what we did was they were actually asked, what will the policy most likely look like? Not what are the range of possibilities, and so you stake out the ends, but where would you be in the middle? So they define something called base policy, which is what they think is most likely to occur. If you look at that, it would have had less energy efficiency than the EPA assumed in the projections that they put out in 2014. It would have had regional cooperation, not a national market, uh, under the old rules. Now, something called a steeper glide path is really important. 
Al and Todd talked yesterday about how the Clean Power Plan works in a series of interim targets down to the 2030 goal. EPA and the rhodium analysis that we presented assume that you stay on that glide path. EIA said, and, and that's not necessarily going to happen, because you have, you have alternative plans that you can propose to the EPA, and as long as you meet the standard over time, meet the averages, you're allowed to go on a steeper glide path, for example. So you could do more later and less now. And in fact, there's a lot of reasons to do that. For example, if you expect technology costs to come down, you may want to wait to take advantage of those instead of making emissions at the front end of a 10-year policy. So that was a really important uh, aspect that was not in the original studies, but which EIA says this is probably how we'll do any sort of policy like this. Um, the, the other big change is that they updated the baseline assumptions. In other words, these policies are always done, or these forecasts are always done, changing one thing and assuming the rest of the world stays exactly the same as how you look at, how you see it now. So um, the 2015 assumptions are actually significantly different from what 2014 were in a couple of important ways, which I'll go into. And finally, the end result of their study, if you use the baseline, is this gray line right here. So underneath these dotted lines are the analyses we did last year. And the gray line is the time path of predicted coal using the clean power plan under the 2014 rules um, using EIA's assumptions. Now they also had an additional policy because as you just heard, you know, what's in the crosshairs now will not be the only thing that's in the crosshairs. Uh, the 2030 target is not going to be the end of this. We actually will have to become more strict after that. So EPA, EIA, not having any guidance on where that might go, said, let's make up one. So they said, let's assume that this continues. And once we hit the 2030 target, EPA says, well, now instead of a 30% reduction from 2005 levels, by 2030, which was the 2014 proposal, we will go to 45% reduction by 2040, and we'll do that in the next 10-year period, so incrementally increasing. Now, the reason that you need to look at that is because firms anticipating that things are only going to get stricter will make different decisions than firms who think, oh, we've hit the target, that's all we're going to have to do. And so this other line, whoops, this other line here, find the red dot is what happens to coal production in Wyoming if things get stricter like that, more stringent. So bottom line, you could have a 41% decline under EI's assumptions. So why is EIA not as bad as us, as, as what we came up with earlier? And it really comes down to that uh, 2015 assumptions. So this is really kind of the secret here. Between 2014 and 2015, the EIA and their own forecasts, which came out in the AEO 2015 analysis, which comes out every year. Um, April is a big month for people who follow energy because this is the big year, the big month that the forecast comes out. You can see that the baseline, that is no regulation outcome, actually increases over what they expected in 2014. So what's going on there? So there's a few things about AEO 2015 that make it different. First thing is, something really major happened in the world that we've all noticed between 2014 and 2015, and that's oil prices went through the floor. And that has a big impact on gas prices, or gas production, which would affect gas prices. The second thing is, they revised their assumptions in a couple other areas. One is the cost to get coal out of the ground, and the other is how much renewables will cost to put up. And so those all go into the model as it rolls through the forecasts, figuring out what are the investment decisions that firms might make and what are their other opportunities. And that's why you need to use one of these major integrated models is because, yeah, they're complex, yeah, they're probably wrong, but they at least integrate within them the kind of sense of how people make decisions in a world where not just one thing is changing, everything is changing. And so, the bottom line is um, the AEO assumptions change in a big way. And they're all more favorable to coal, at least in the short term. One of the things about renewable costs going down is if you're trying to hit a target and you're changing from coal to natural gas, 
you're reducing CO2 per unit of electricity produced by about half. But if you go to renewables, straight from coal to renewables, you go to zero. So if you add more renewables, you actually have more room for coal. So this is one of the things that happens in this. So if we just look at this, this is first of all the difference in oil. Oil productions had to be really dramatically revised. So oil price assumptions are much lower. What does that mean for gas? Gas is a co-product of oil in a lot of places. It means there'll be less gas, higher prices. Higher prices, less use of gas for electricity. Coal becomes more competitive. So what does that look like? Well, this is a busy picture, but first, in the new AEO simulations, gas is about 7 to 8% more expensive through the 2020s when this policy occurs than we would have expected, at least in 2014. The other major thing is that coal costs are now the production costs of coal, which directly re are reflected in the price of coal, are also supposed to be about 20% lower. So you have those two things at the margin. Coal's going to be cheaper. Gas is going to be more expensive. That flip to gas slows down. And so there's more coal in the future regardless of regulation. So then the next thing is, if you're not going to use gas, you're probably going to use renewables. And that's the third part of this. If renewables are expected to be cheaper, then you go directly to renewables. So the EIA analysis differed in a big way from even what they would have gotten had they used 2014. But we'll call them the EIA. We'll call ours the rhodium analysis because we use their model. The bottom line is that the clean power plan, the way to get to the targets under 2014 assumptions was to use natural gas. EIA says the way to get to the targets is to actually use renewables. So gas is actually bridged out. In fact, because gas is going to eventually be part of the problem, firms just begin to say, let's use less of that and go directly to renewables. And so that's what happens in these models. So overall, Wyoming could see, you know, given all this world of production assumptions and costs and all these other things and different simulations, so what's the range now? It's not going to help you a lot. Wyoming coal production could go down anywhere from 24% to 50% or more. Okay, so does that help? Probably not. <laughs> uh, but at least it's a narrower window than zero to gone. Um, so that's part of the first part of this analysis. Um, if you were to bet on this, probably the 25% range is more likely. So we can look and see what that does uh, to the economy. Um, if we were to go out further, though, past 2030, it's possible that as things get stricter, we'll see the 40% and 50% reductions occur. So some analyses show that by 2050, if you just look at the retirements that are expected in the coal fleet, they're not expected to be replaced right now with coal again. That by 2050, we could see an electricity grid that produces about 10% of its electricity from coal as opposed to 40% now. So those are the sorts of things that come out of these models. Now, we didn't go out that far to predict that. But the key here is that results are sensitive to assumptions. Assumptions are made given the fact that we don't have a crystal ball to know what the world will look like in the future. So last year I just showed you how the clean power plan affects, um, affects employment in the state and several other things. You saw that in the, uh, in, the first in the first presentation this morning, some numbers we had. So these were numbers from the previous ones. I won't go over them too much. On the left panel are the losses in employment in the coal sector. And we define the coal sector most widely. So this includes generation and the sectors around generation support and induced expenditures from those incomes. We include the coal sector, support and induced. We include the railroad sector, support and induced. So we call that the coal economy. If you look at that, we were looking at statewide reductions in employment of about 3%, which you might think, huh, not so bad. 3% is a pretty bad recession in an economy. So that was the first thing in coal, but in the original, when you thought gas might bridge to this, because we are a super well-diversified economy, because we produce oil, gas, and coal, um, that gas production was going to help us. And so you know, there was this question of, well, if gas is stimulated, maybe those people that lose their job in coal can go over to Natrona County or wherever, over to Pinedale, and produce some gas. 
and then you see the results there. So the final bottom line results that were predicted were anywhere from a 2.5% reduction in employment to about a 3.2% reduction. So go in the middle, about 2.8 maybe. That was last year, that, or at least last spring when we were working through these. Now we look at the EIA. Now the EIA is saying coal will get hit, but renewables are the bridge, so it gives a little more room for coal, and by the way, coal is going to be more affordable. So these are the numbers, same panels, busy I know, so I'll go to the bottom line in a second. The thing I want to take from this is coal reductions are less and the gas increases are less. So bottom line, exactly the same numbers. Overall outcome on unemployment is still about a 2.8% or employment is still about a 2.8% reduction in the state. I could, you know, if you want to see lots of numbers, we can go through incomes, value added, everything else that come out of these models. But the bottom line is the overall result hasn't changed much, despite the fact that the world became more favorable to coal. It hurts the economy now because it's less favorable to gas. And we do both. So with respect to state revenues, um, because we had that wider range, that spectral analysis in our last analysis. Um, state revenues, which we heard a lot about in the news in the last few days as the governor announced not only the test center, but um, asked state agencies to go into a hiring freeze and to reduce their current budgets by $200 million, which believe me, since I don't just try to figure out what's going to happen to state revenues. I actually then spend them because I'm a department chair, and right now I have three hiring searches for faculty going on, and guess what? I think they're all frozen. So, you know, I, I feel it on both ends. Um, but the bottom line is the original results suggested that it would be somewhere between 10 and 40 percent decline in energy revenues, and this all depends on what happens to oil and gas as well as coal. The new results that kind of came out of the EIA numbers, which again, were really a sensitivity around how they thought this would actually occur, are much narrower because of the design of the simulations and their best guess, using their numbers through our models, that our best guess would be about a 13 to 14% in, uh, reduction in state energy revenues. Now remember, we get our revenues from a lot of other sources, but coal, makes up about 11, just on its own, makes up about 11% of the state's revenue. So you reduce that by 13 to 14%. You see that also going down in oil and gas. And you know, what it means is you know, it's not exactly rosy time to head, which we're already beginning to see. But the bottom line is there's been kind of a trade-off. In order to start later, the regulations now ask for a 32% reduction from 2005 levels by 2030. So in fact, what we've done is we've tilted the glide path more steeply. So one of the things that you could say of these EIA predictions, even though they're modeling a different set of standards, that they can tell us something about how things might look because we're going to be forced onto a steeper glide path now. The second thing is, as I said before, the impact of the clean power plan is not going to be in our utility sector. It's going to be in the overall coal economy. Our utility sector is only a small part of that. What really matters is what happened to the targets for all the other Wyoming customers. Um, if they have less stringent targets, then we get off easier. If they have more stringent targets, then things could be even worse. So how did they change? Couple things that you need to remember when you compare the targets. You can't directly compare them. So I see this all the time. People say, this was our old target, this is our new target. You can't do that, at least not directly. It's kind of an apples and oranges comparison. Yeah, we have to get to a final number, but it's measured differently. So there's a measurement issue here. So under the mass-based targets, <clears throat> One of the things that you may not know in the technical support document that came out converting what were originally just rate-based targets to mass-based, they just gave guidance. It came out last late October, November last year, just before comments were due. And it said, this is how you could go about computing these mass-based targets. Now, mass-based targets from rate-based targets are really hard to do for one reason. 
Rate-based targets is how much you produce, if you want to think about it, per unit of output. Well, how much output will there be? Depends on how big the economy is. So you have to have a prediction built in there. How do you think the economy is going to grow over time? Mass-based targets is really simple. It's just how much stuff went in the air. So you are effectively being asked to convert from something that's a prediction to something that's a certainty. Well, of course, it's going to depend on your assumptions. So one of the things within that technical service document or support document was this is how you could go about doing it. Well, another little minor thing that seems to have Escape many people's notice. They had a little problem with this at NASA a few years ago where they sent a, sent a probe off to Mars and it never was heard from again. Unfortunately, they didn't convert the units from metric into imperial very well or at all. And that had, we think that the probe, I think, hit the ground. I'm not sure what happened. Our uh, NASA engineer back there could tell us. Well, same thing here. A lot of people have immediately compared mass-based targets from the old to the new after they did their own computation. This time around, the EPA actually came out and said, these are what the mass-based targets will be. They're in different units. Some are in metric. The old ones were in metric tons. The new ones are in short tons. So first of all, if you're going to do that comparison, this one's a pretty simple one, take 10%, which is the difference between the two units. You have to add that in. All right. If you were to do that, Wyoming's new target looks about 27, 24%, I should say, more strict than the old target. Um, if you look at the race-based, rate-based ones, and these are more difficult to think about because there's a couple things that go on. First of all, tar state targets changed. And there's a couple questions. You could have a state that had an easier target, that is, it's more lenient. Now, Wyoming certainly isn't that, but imagine one. And you might say, oh, we got off easy. But in fact, that, if you just compared one target to the other, that wouldn't be enough. Because not only did you get off easier, but the rules changed. And in fact, to meet that target, you might be allowed to do more things, which means you got really off easier. It wasn't very good English, sorry. Um, but that, you know, so one of the, one of the uh, examples of that was how they treated nuclear under construction. That changed in a new rule. You're now allowed to count it, which means if you're one of those states, there were three of them, you now have an additional path to get there. And by the way, most of those states saw their target become easier. So how much easier did it get? The target didn't tell you the whole story. On the other side, and again, we heard about this yesterday, the target may have changed. But also, you may have fewer ways to get to the goal. And one of the ways that we used to have to get to the goal was we used to get to count our existing renewables. Now we don't. So that makes it harder. Uh, nuclear was also in there as well. So if you kind of take into account just those two changes, you have to modify the number. And I can go through the calculations with you if you want to see it. But the bottom line is now under the rate based, it seems like Wyoming's target is about 30% uh, more stringent than it was under the original 2014 proposal. All right. But really, it doesn't really matter what happened to Wyoming, except we all like to wonder what, you know, were we treated fairly, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the bottom line is, again, it doesn't matter. What really matters is what are our major customers and how did their targets change? So just using mass. Looking at the targets, percent changes, everything above the dotted line is 90% of our coal market. And if you look at all those states, you kind of get, oh, there's a bit of a mix there. But it turns out that overall, the targets got slightly easier for those states, which is good news for our coal sector. Now, it doesn't mean that we get off the hook and we're going to see no effect. It's just the effect might not be as bad as it could have been. Now, how do you really figure out what that's going to be? You commission another NEM simulation, which trust me is a big simulation, and you start working to crunch through how this is going to affect PRB coal, how it's going to affect gas, how it's going to affect use of other energy, how it might build out renewables. You do it for several simulations. It's a lot of programming. You have to make a lot of assumptions. But at the end of the day, we haven't done that. We're hoping to have that done by Christmas. And we're working again with Rhodium to do that. All right, so I promised that I might have a little bit of a meltdown. It depends on how you look at it. Uh, 
So just some final observations, kind of reflecting on what we heard yesterday and maybe today. The first thing is that any CO2 policy is going to be hard on coal. It's just the way it is, because coal creates the most CO2 per unit of output of any fuel. The next thing we have to deal with is, for better or for worse, whether you like it or not, whether you agree or don't agree, society has decided to control CO2. We have to. That's our responsibility now. And again, that's why these conferences are conducted, why the technology conference preceded this one. So the real question I would ask as a policymaker is, does it have to be this hard on Wyoming coal and, in general, the American economy? And that's more important. If whatever we decide to do as a society, we should try to do it at least cost. And I'm not convinced that these rules do this. That'll be no news to an economist. It's like, duh. But you know, to most people, now we get into the politics. The best way to do this would have been some direct means, which in economists speak is market-based regulation, not what we have now. Anything, what you try to do is make it as simple as possible, as wide as possible, so that you can capture all the potential. Well, you can basically include the least cost options everywhere you look, right? Pick the low-hanging fruit first before you go up the tree. So the question is, have we increased the complexity and more importantly the social cost of CO2 because we chose as a society to go about it the way we have? And the reason we have is because Congress failed to act, right? We had two parties, if we go back to 2008, that campaigned in the presidential election both having platforms for climate control trading. Mc Senator McCain and Senator at the time Obama. Neither one of those came to pass. And so, you know, basically we're left with the mess. So the unwillingness to create new laws, which is effectively our government's responsibility, led to an agency that has to create those laws when something is deemed to be hazardous having to act. That's another law. They have to do it. So at the end of the day, the EPA has to do it. Well, the EPA only has certain legal frameworks to regulate in. The framework that they have is the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act was designed at a time, it's a command and control type of regulation. It was designed at a time when we thought that that particular pollutant, we will look at the plant, we will say what are the technology options available, and we will define a technology for it, which is this whole thing about best system of emission reductions. This was not the type of rulemaking, well, it isn't now the type of rulemaking that is optimal. We've found out since, first of all, the Clean Air Act amendments in 1990 changed this. And we had an act of Congress, allowed trading for SO2. And it's been far cheaper than what the alternative would have been. So we're stuck with a command and control method of doing things. And in fact, to Todd and Al's comments yesterday, if you read the Clean Power Plan, they're open about it. What they want to see is a trading scheme. They just can't do it through what we would normally have, which is an act of Congress, so they have to do it through their rules. So what you have is the Clean Air Act being bent to go into places that are not defined, and they go there, and the re you know, a big part of the reason, if you read the 1,500 pages or so of just the final rule, the reason it's so long, and the, origi the, ris the reason the original proposal is so long is because most of the stuff you have to wade through is the legal justification for why they think they can do this. The rules themselves are actually, if you could just condense them out, it's actually far less. Most of it is why they think they can do this and why they claim this is the best system of emission reduction and why it can be considered that way when they go outside the fence. Because the bottom line is to reduce CO2, you basically have to switch fuels. It's, the technological solution right now is very expensive, right? Carbon capture, although we just heard about how that could change. So the bottom line is, we now have, because you're bending it all over the place into things that it was never intended to do in areas that are undefined, you have all this legal uncertainty. Will the rule actually stand up? 
And in fact, a lot of the final rule was changed in order to buttress it against what became the legal challenges to the proposal. For example, energy efficiency got dropped out as an actual building block. So this is what we're left with. More uncertainty, an inferior rule, one that doesn't look at all of our opportunities and therefore raises the cost of carbon control. So when you have a command and control system, and to free marketeers, this is horrible, what you end up with is what's called industrial policy. And what we have now is a form of green industrial policy. Because you hit command and control, and they hit particular standards, and they limit the ways you can go around that, that is effectively like saying, this will be the winner, that will be the loser, and this is how much they'll win, and this is how much they'll lose. So what we're left with is instead of firms and markets and people making optimal decisions, we start with something that's less than that. And so that's going to raise the cost of control. If we had done, you know, so first of all, tax is a four-letter word in Wyoming. I know that. But, you know, if you ask almost any economist, the best way to do this would have been a carbon tax, right? Just cost of carbon. It's easy to calculate how much CO2 is produced by any unit of fuel that's burned if it's a fossil fuel. We could have done that. To Don's point yesterday, had you used a carbon tax, just simply you could bring the stationary and the, and the mobile sectors together. A gallon of gas would be taxed. It would be built in, the carbon tax, if you buy it. People could look at that. They could look at other things. We could look at the total emissions reduction done in the transport sector versus the stationary sector. We would have been much better off. Not doing that means that the stationary sector has to carry a, a larger load than it might otherwise do, which, of course, comes back to us. More coal is going to be hit. Even though coal is a very efficient, very cheap means of production. So I'm not arguing against the clean power plan. I'm not arguing against carbon control. I'm just arguing against really expensive ways of getting to what we want to get done. So had we had a carbon tax, and you can just, if you want to, you can substitute emission trading. We would have incentivized firms in a better way than we are now to take on R&D. We would have had a cleaner set of rules, hopefully, especially if it was a tax, which would have created less legal uncertainty because it probably would have been passed, it would have had to have been passed by Congress, and then we could have gotten on with the business. We're probably about 10 years behind where we need to be on CCUS. If you were here for the previous two days, you've heard that. We're trying to catch up, but you can't do anything about lost time. If you use a tax, or we heard a little bit yesterday, yes, it's true. If you do emission trading, you're effectively creating money because you're creating permits that now have monetary value. And there's a big question of allocation. Well, you don't have to allocate those permits. You don't have to give them to people. You can actually use an auction, which is how they do the SO2 one. And then you get the revenue. You can use that revenue for public goals. One of the public goals could have been to lower other taxes in the economy, which you could do with what we call a revenue-neutral carbon tax or revenue-reducing near-neutral carbon tax. Or you could use these revenues for R&D. Alberta does that. They have what is a carbon tax. They don't call it a tax because that would be unpopular. But it's a tax. And what do they do? They shovel that back into research. And they've just raised that tax. Now they have so much money that they're actually going out. They can't spend it all. They're going outside of Alberta to find other places to find opportunities to do research, to find better ways to use these carbon fuels or to store it or, or meet the challenges. We didn't do that. So just a couple more final observations, and then I'll let you go, because I know I'm the last thing standing between you and a hiker going home or whatever. Um, good policy requires good and objective analysis. By that, we mean it should be transparent, it should be open for criticism, and it should build upon other findings. It also requires, because there's a political process, education. And unfortunately, the energy system is probably among the most complex systems we've ever invented. 
right? You talk to a lot of people and you ask them, where does electricity come from? They say from the plug in the wall. You know, even if you said it comes from the power plant. I mean, if I were to get into what I do with my students, let's talk about energy markets and markets in the production of energy, and let's talk about electricity, because it's by far the most complex. And we have these energy markets. You can arrange things in ISOs and RTOs where they actually have an open market for production. They try to get to the least cost. They basically get bids. Whoops. They get bids. I told you I'd have a meltdown. And they, get a, they create a supply curve. They think this is what the demand is. They go for the intersection. Econ 101, there's the price. That's how some people do it. Not Wyoming, not most of the WEC. But the bottom line is that's only half of it. If you then try to explain to somebody, well, there's these things called power purchase agreements. And this company over here buys the green energy from over there, and therefore they now have green power. So every electron coming out of their plug is green, except it's not. Right? So if you live where I do in, in Laramie and you drink a lot of New Belgium breweries beer, they say that they're 100% renewable powered, except right down the road is the rawhide plant big coal-powered plant, and I guarantee you every single electron probably coming out of their plug most of the time is a brown electron. It's not a windmill electron. Maybe a few are, but this is kind of like peeing in the pool, right? You get the mix. So the bottom line is, you know, this is a whole other thing that goes on, these financial markets, and it's hard to understand, so I get that. So one of the other things is careless use of numbers and this sort of thing really ticks me off, all right? And we heard about some numbers yesterday that, you know, how do you put these things in context? Kemper, straight up question, what will it cost to build your facility? Mm, I don't want to comment on that because there's a number, $6.2 billion is the current number for that plant. For a 525 megawatt plant, that's really expensive electricity. Now granted, they're capturing 65% of their CO2 hopefully, when it runs. But it's a big number. We heard another number yesterday, over $11 billion for 5,200 megawatts of power that might be necessary to get over the shortage that we're going to have between what we have to reduce to and what our current power plants do. OK, so we, two numbers there, 5,200 megawatts. Big number, except straight up question, not answered. Does that include Choke Cherry Sierra Madre? No answer. That's a 3,000 megawatt capacity plant. You're over halfway there. You add Pathfinder, 2,400 megawatts. That's 5,400 megawatts. All of a sudden, 5,200 megawatts, not such a hard lift. Another thing, 5,200 megawatts is 15 years away. How many other plants will be built and will people want to build if renewable is the way people choose to go? Well, you need, what about transmission? If the coal plants go away, transmission lines open up. And in Wyoming, that's a big deal. One, our most congested power line runs from Jim Bridger over to Utah. Jim Bridger is scheduled to close early 2030s. There's a gigantic power line available. If it closes earlier, it's there. If Dave Johnson closes, it's there. So as we make these transitions, other things happen. You have to bring those in. The other thing is that $11 billion is for a long-lived asset. That doesn't happen every year. It's a 20-year asset at least. So what does that mean? I don't know. Work out the capacity factors. Figure out the numbers you want. The bottom line is it takes some analysis. Let's look at a couple other numbers that are really big. Total electricity revenue in 2013, $1.3 billion was what the total revenue was if you look at power sales in Wyoming according to the EIA. That was for 17 million megawatt hours. But Wyoming produced 45 million, or 42 million, sorry, 45.3 million megawatt hours from coal. The rest went elsewhere. I would give you a number, except I don't know who bought it because it goes off into the pool where everybody's peeing. So I don't know. But the bottom line is, that's a big number. But if you say 45 million megawatts, that's like six zeros in front of a number with six zeros in it up to begin with, 
It's a big number. Nobody can comprehend that. So I would, this is the kind of thing that I do to my students. I say, so let's make that number meaningful. Let's figure out how many overnight phone charges would be necessary. So for homework, I will let you try to figure out that 45.3 million megawatt hours that was produced by coal last, in 2013, the last year we have data, how many charges would that do on my Samsung phone, which is pretty normal. It's a four, by the way, so it's old. I'm waiting for my upgrade. 7.2 watt hour battery. Let you work that out. I'll give you a hint, it's a really, really big number. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to use the, the little E key or whatever. But anyway, <laughs> are we willing to do the hard analysis to, to, to actually approach these policies? On one side, we've got people like Al and Todd and, and professionals like you in the room trying to figure out how we adapt. On the other side, we have a pretty dysfunctional political system. I don't care which party you're on, you know, when you watch the current Republican primary or what happened in the House yesterday, you recognize that, you know, this is not conducive to getting hard decisions done. So where are we going to go? And I would leave you with this, that Wyoming, and I know this may be very naive, Wyoming should be leading the charge not only for trying to find new technological solutions, but for good policy. We were the first state, because of some forethought of some people, Lloyd in the back for one, the board for another, hey, we need a coal study. That coal study, you know, when I first was asked to do that coal study, it's like, coal. You know, just cut my veins now. It doesn't sound that sexy, right? But, but the bottom line was, and then it got way harder, and all of a sudden it was clean power plan. The clean power plan didn't look like anything anybody anticipated because we're all expecting it to look like a normal EPA rule, and it comes out with this building blocks and best system of emission reduction that's outside the fence, and we're all just like, how do you analyze this? And it became really interesting. But the bottom line is we were the only state to actually try to figure out what this might do to our own economy. The other thing I would argue is that Wyoming, while we're just a little state with only three congressional votes, you know, if I had one dream, and I know this is truly naive, I would ask our legislators to actually do better analysis and at least force a better outcome. So here's my positive spin on what I think is going on. So I'll leave you with hopefully a positive thought. Okay, as ugly as it is, we have two sides of the spectrum, those for, those against. One side gets the rules. They may be politically in favor of it. They may just think it's expedient or pragmatic. They immediately go to work and say, how will we do this? Call them the Montanas of the world. They open up papers and they say, we're, we have six ideas of how we might deal with the clean power plan. We're open to find partners in the rest of the WEC to do this regional cooperation. On the other side, we have the, Mont the Wyomings of the world, whose first response is litigate. And litigating is not really that expensive compared to these really big numbers. And especially, here's the point though, litigation hopefully could get you better rules. To be honest with you, if we could toss out the clean power plan, I would not be that unhappy about it because I would hope that something that came out of it was a better rule. If we could get rid of the clean power plan for a better rule, like go back to the drawing board, look at all the costs of this plan. You heard about how the utilities and the, and the regulators are trying to work this out. They are really unclear of how to do this. What if you got all those people in a room and they forced people to say, look, wouldn't it be simpler if we just went to that thing that you're going to have to make a vote on? Well, guess what? You were elected to make hard votes, not to avoid them. So my argument would be that I really think that Wyoming should be advocating for better policy, even if it's not what we would naturally go for. And so I would leave that challenge out there that I really think that Wyoming could be an advocate not only for developing technology, as we heard the governor say yesterday, but also for advocating new, innovative policy methods. If you, you just have to look north of the border to British Columbia to see what a revenue neutral carbon tax can do and how disruptive it may not be. 
If you do it badly, of course, you can look at Australia and see what a, re what a carbon tax looks like when you don't get political support for it. But the bottom line is, that could be a better way to go. And, and you know, basically, we are where we are. That's a Yogi Bearism, I think. He just died a few weeks ago. But the bottom line is, you know, can we do something about this? So yeah, we can go through these Byzantine calculations and a whole bunch of simulations to see around the corner, but it would be a lot easier if at the same time there's somebody on the other side just advocating for good policy that will lead to the lowest cost. We've heard companies like Duke say, if they could have one thing, it would be a carbon tax. Certainty. We've also heard yesterday, or two days ago, at the end of the, uh, of the SER Coal Technologies Conference, if you know anything about CCUS, you know about Howard Herzog. What, did he, what does he dream of? A revenue neutral carbon tax, because there's just not the policy push to get these technological solutions moving forward. And if, if we're in Wyoming and we care about these resources and we want to be good stewards of them, we don't want them to become a stranded asset, that is what we need. And so that's what I would leave you with. Um, if you want to send me hate mail, there's my contact information. Just a quick question. Go back to the slide where you showed the coal mines and their volumes. That was like your second slide. Yeah, the one with the box. That one. Yep. So based on the reductions that are potential, the bandwidth, you're looking at two or three operating mines in the Powder River Basin. Two or three opening. Sorry. Well, I mean, North Rochelle, Black Thunder, there's 200 million. Oh, okay. So, so, we, so you end up with three, two or three operating mines because they're not, they're not going to, everybody's not going to take their proportional cut. Right. It's going to be. Some mines the, will close. Some the mines, strongest yeah, mines, the, the biggest economies. So that's a, that's a consideration when you take a look at the mines. And also the other thing, it's probably just a nuance, but do you think economies of scale are are an issue for the mines and affecting price, or is that just a blip on the economics of it? Do I think economies of scale are important? Well, as, as you reduce the volume right. kind of thing, is that, is that really noise in the equation? So as an economist, not as somebody who works in the, you know, trying to figure these out, or individual firms, you want to mine the easiest stuff first, right? The low-hanging fruit. However that works out. So there's, there's, there would be offsets. There will be economies. The reason that the Powder River Basin got so big was economies of scale. That is the number one contributor. Number two was cheap transport costs. In the 1980s, SO2 concerns and low sulfur was the third. People tend to think that's what did it. We were growing in the 70s due to economies of scale. So economies of scale are hugely important. But offsetting that is the fact that if you have a mine over here with more easily accessed coal, then that's an offset, right? So what is the optimal mix of the coal plants? That's what we leave the firms to do, right? Which, how do you make money? What creates the most profitable opportunity? And as an economist, we just kind of say that's what markets work out, right? You working to maximize your profits, other people working to maximize competition, and somehow we magically get the invisible hand to get us to the least cost solution to society. So to, your, to answer your question, Economies of scale will matter. It's not just going to be, you know, 40% or a 20% ramp down at each of these plants. Some are going to close. The weaker ones are going to close. In fact, um, investor groups are already asking companies like Arch and Peabody, you know, ones who have multiple assets in the Powder River Basin, tell us the expenditures at each of your pits. How much is the coal actually costing to get out? So far, they've been very reticent to tell people which ones are expensive because investors are trying to figure out, can you make money? And you know, it's, it's more complicated. That's not just one big hole, right? Anybody who's been up there knows that the, any of those complexes are a bunch of mining operations. So you know, to answer your question, it'd be a part of it. It won't be all of it. We would expect some mines to close, some mines to stay open. There's going to be a reorganization probably in the coal industry. They have debt. They have to get rid of it. Investors made bets. It's not going to work out probably for some of them. So there will probably be new names. But the one thing I would say is that probably the last coal train that ever leaves the station will leave out of the Powder River Basin because we just are so cheap.
If you're going to use coal at all, you know, maybe our market will shrink and come closer to Wyoming, but at the end of the day, Wyoming will still produce coal for electricity, even if that sector is only 10% of our power. Thanks, Rob. I'm glad to see you're excited about doing the study now. <laughs> We're working on that work scope and all those different scenarios. <laughs> yeah, on the, radio, or on the phone, yeah. So, so Don's talking about these painful uh, conference calls that we had where we would like talk about defining market threats and things like that. So yeah. yeah. We were trying to box in what, you know, for me it was, you know, the same thing, scenarios. So right. I just want to echo, I definitely agree with good analysis to guide good uh, understanding to then guide good policy. Absolutely necessary understanding and thinking through the ramifications and possible consequences that aren't always in our control or we have a very muddy crystal ball. Uh, <clears throat> So definitely, that's exactly what's needed. And so part of the purpose of the study was so then, you know, quick updates or changes in scenarios and what ifs could be done now that we have the modeling tools here in the state. So the fact that you're able to do this real quickly and adjust to these changing rigs and economic conditions is really helpful. And then, by the way, that, that money that you spent is money that's still buying, right? Yeah. I mean. So to be perfectly open to everybody, the WI commissioned the study at a cost of about $43,000. The University of Wyoming chipped in another 20-some, 20 28,000. Um, the study was originally supposed to end last, late last year. Because of the complexity, it became early this spring. But we are still chugging away at this thing, so, and we will continue to try to provide that analysis where it's needed. And in fact, we're now spending money in fact, recycling the money that came to us to both find the people and find the data to keep doing this. And, and you know, I'll, we'll be humble about it. Our analysis is not the best analysis out there because there's shortcomings with our tools. But the way we look at it is, is an informed number, even if it's wrong, is at least we can talk about why it's wrong or why there's a margin as opposed to no number at all, which becomes just fodder for bad policy. And Yogi Berra, I like his saying, says, you got to be careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. Right. So this is really helpful in helping us figure out where we're going. Well, I was really interested in your slide about the price of natural gas the EIA had shown. And that is uh, you know, something I'd read recently, you know, indicates future markets for gas showing natural gas not getting above $4 right. until 2025. And in the left side of that chart, we're already above $4, which we're not even there today. Right. So that would tell me that maybe some of those projections for coal relative to natural gas com 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 competition is actually worse than what's shown in that analysis. Probably. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, this is the problem of taking the pulse of the world now and then trying to figure out what you think it will look like so that you can feed these big, ugly models that require some assumption to chug along to get a conclusion. So, you know, we had the pendulum swing one way, which was the, the green lines are the old, are the old um, projections. The red lines are the new ones. And so you can see, you know, we got a good and a bad there, right? Well, actually, we got two goods. We got gas went up, coal costs went down. But there's noise in those things, and that's what the sensitivities are for. And in fact, that's why it's so much fun to play with the AEO projections, except now they come out every two years with like their 30 scenarios. And included in those scenarios is a carbon tax scenario that they run through at a $10 tax and a $25 tax. Um, we'll see if they do that in 2016. But one of the things I didn't mention is the projected outcome of the carbon tax was relatively similar to what the Clean Power Plan was projected to do in our original analysis, at least at $10. But if you think about, you know, what these models can't capture is all of these additional costs that Al and Todd talked about yesterday, not to mention that uncertainty. So, you know, the cleaner and more transparent you could make those rules and advocating for and wide, the better this would be. Now, you know, I can only say that as an economist and have faith in my theory because I don't have a laboratory to test this on. And the best we can do is create these virtual ones. Um, but, you know, I really do think 
that you know, if Wyoming wanted to protect its own resources, it shouldn't just automatically jump in bed with several other states that look like it, because our interests are often very different from, say, Kentucky's. And that's before you get to the politics, right? Kentucky, I kind of think of as a senior citizen. If you can get a few more years of life, that's great. Sorry for anybody who's, you know, but including me. I'm, but if you're a relatively young person, what we're talking about is do they die at 65 or do they live to old age? That's kind of Wyoming. Or do they die at 50? And so my concern is that, you know, if, for example, in the original Clean Power Plan, if we litigated away and got rid of energy efficiency, which was pushed out anyway just basically under the threat, you can still use it for compliance, but it's not a building block. That was actually a real path, and you and I have talked about this, to creating savings, which actually make it easier on the coal sector. Now it's gone. We should have been the biggest advocate for energy efficiency, but we were actually on the bandwagon to sue, and we would have pulled that thread if we could, if we could stop this. And you know, so I don't see that as, as productive. And the energy efficiency may still happen anyhow outside right. of its normal market, but it's not being analyzed because it's not a policy option. Exactly. It, well, it, it's in there, but it's in there with some cost models. So it's one of your generation choices. And so in these models, less energy efficiency occurs because, in effect, it's not being picked as a winner under this command and control. All right. Well, I think we could talk about this for a long time. But in the name of uh, getting some people out to flights that they need to catch and wrapping up uh, in good order, I, I think that's a good place to stop. Um, Mr. Yes. And thank you, Dr. Godfrey.